you study? I mean, who did you who did you look at from from afar or or, or up close from the wings and say, you know, I, that's really good. I wanna... Oh, well, I think the earliest was the earliest influence that I had and I, I was Edward Everett Horton, the famous comedian, uh, who I was lucky enough to play on the stage with when I was very young. And we did Springtime for Henry, which was his famous play that he toured all over and made an absolute fortune. And, and a fortune for the author, who hated him because he had changed the play totally into a kind of wonderful ad-lib thing. And a mime, he would mime for, uh, I'd watch him do a whole scene where he was waiting for somebody and he'd, he'd be tapping on his chair and then he thought, what the hell's that? Is it raining? <laughs> 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 then he put the umbrella up in the middle of the living room. And he, he reacted in the most extraordinary way to everything. There was eight minutes of sheer mime. Mm -hmm. And the audience was in stitches. Of course, the author was infuriated. <laughs> uh, and I, I learned so much from Eddie just watching him. And the wonderful thing that he, he did, you've seen him on the screen in, in those old movies with Fred Astaire. He's always fantastic. And, but on the stage, he was extraordinary because he'd been trained by Weber and Fields, the famous vaudeville duo, way back. So he knew his vaudeville by the back of his hand. And the wonderful thing about vaudevillians when they're really great is that when they act, they are totally real. They're suddenly so intimate. I mean, his comedy was so, it was all, oh, oh, it, it was so intimate and extraordinary. I, I never thought God, how modern he is. And he's even older than I am. <laughs> um, I, I, he was a huge influence. It's interesting because sometimes the method, the method folks who are, can be great actors, they, they carry, you know, they, when they have to do comedy, it's not, it's not as real. In some ways, the, the, the training, the Bonvillian, the British training, they can play farce as if really there is something momentous at stake, life or death. Yes. Uh, he, he was like that, and they all are like that. They're, in fact, they were more method than the method actors. They were so incredibly real with the comedy. They're absolutely straight, believed it implicitly, all that far stuff. And it was three times as funny, of course. How was it like then to go into all these a lot of really terrible movies where you couldn't really kind of even establish a performer's rhythm. Are you talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about the movies. You yourself said they were just these colossal bean bags that yes, yes. weighed a ton. And yeah, in the 60s. Yeah. Oh my God. Of course, the 60s was wonderful. I spent, I was lucky enough to spend all of the 60s and, and into the 70s in London, which of course then was swinging London, and that was the place to be. Um, America was still struggling with Vietnam, so everything was a little bit depressing over here, and everybody had moved to London where everything was happening. Design, music, and theater, of course. And tax shelter movies. <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> international But everything, everything we did in the movies was as if, there was, as if we were, it was limitless money. It was, the 60s spelt uh, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. And, uh, the, the waste of money and waste of time that was put into these bloody epics. I mean, endless lunches. We'd all have lunch for two or three hours and come back in the afternoon swacked out of our skulls. <laughs> <laughs> and when you look at those pictures now, um, even the ones that I'm not in, um, you'll say, God, they're slow.